Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, International State Crime Initiative event, Torture the Marks of Civilization. Uh, thank you all for attending. May I kindly ask that you mute uh, your mic for the duration of this talk. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Angela Sherwood and Dr. Alicia Delacour Benning for organizing this event and for kindly, kindly inviting me to speak. So a little bit about the hosts of this event. The International State Crime Initiative is an interdisciplinary research center based at the School of Law, founded in 2011 by Professor Penny Green and currently directed by to uh, Dr. Thomas McManus. The center brings together a community of scholars who examine states in corporate crimes and resistance to elite violence. It also actively supports the work of civil society in censuring crimes committed by powerful actors, such as Myanmar, where ISKI researchers are actively supporting civil society actors on the ground who are involved in challenging the recent military coup. Among its ongoing projects, ISKI has recently launched a special issue of the State Crime Journal, State Crime, Structural Violence and COVID-19, which focuses on the COVID-19 pandemic the linkages between the pandemic's devastating impacts and prior state criminality, and the ways in which states are exploiting the health crises to undermine democratic principles and violate the civil and political rights of their citizens and migrants. If you are interested in learning more about ISKI's work, we'll pop a few links in the chat function to the side. So the format of this event is going to be a conversation between myself and our esteemed guest, Dr. Michelle Farrell, for about uh, 20 or 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up for Q&A for about 30 to 45 minutes. And what I'll ask you to do is that if you do have a question, uh, make uh, me aware of that in the chat function, and then I'll invite you to unmute your mic and ask Michelle your question directly. So a little bit about our guest. Uh, Michelle is a reader in law in the School of Law and Social Justice at the University of Liverpool, and she currently holds a Leverhulme Trust Research Fellowship for her project on the political theology of torture. Michelle joined the University of Liverpool in September 2012 and researches in international law and human rights law. She writes about histories and practices of torture, as well as the prohibition of torture and other forms of ill treatment. Michelle is also interested in conflict, counterterrorism, and states of emergency from historical, theoretical, and human rights perspectives where she employs an anxious critique of rights and her research is particularly informed by continental philosophy and critical theory. Michelle's first monograph, The Prohibition on Torture in Exceptional Circumstances, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2013. And she's also been interested in discourses around human rights and is a co-editor along with Drywood and Hughes of Human Rights in the Media, Fear and Fetish, published by Routledge in 2019, which examines the representation of human rights in the media uh, in the context of the UK Human Rights Act repealed uh, debate. So firstly, welcome to Michelle. Um, now, this is a timely subject, as always. Some of you may have been aware of the fact that the German court recently uh, sentenced a former Syrian intelligence officer to four and a half years uh, in jail for complicity in torture. And the, the human rights lawyers that were behind the case have spent years uni, using the, the principle of uh, Euro universal jurisdiction, um, which is, uh, for those of you that may not be familiar, the ability of domestic judicial systems of a state to investigate and prosecute state crimes, even if they're not committed on its territory by one of its nationals or against one of its nationals, uh, use this principle to reach across the borders to pursue other allegations. Their targets have also included the former US president, George W. Bush, uh, Dodge, George W. Bush, for crimes including violations of the UN Convention Against Torture. Perhaps this is something that we might come back to uh, later on in our conversation or in the Q and A. So my first question, uh, Michelle, is um, the, the the definition of torture you say under international law reifies state justifications of using torture. So this prohibition enables torture, you are arguing. Can you elaborate a little bit on this, on this paradox, please? 
Uh, thanks very much, Tanzel, um, and uh, thank you all. Thank you all for being here. And just before I answer that question, can I just say a, a little hello to everyone? And uh, thanks to the State Crime Initiative for having me here. And thanks to both Angela Sherwood and Alicia de Corbenning for all of their help in organising it. And to you, Tanzel, of course, for being willing to share it and having to uh, read some of this work of mine. So thank you for that. Um, that question, so the question of whether the UN Convention Against Torture enables torture, um, it's a sort of slightly provocative way, I think, of trying to understand um, the way in which we understand torture today. So, so when I talk about the definition of torture, reifying justifications, um, I guess I'm really trying to, to help us to understand the public imagination of torture that we have, which I think is produced by uh, the definition of torture. So the easiest way of thinking about this is by looking at the core of, for example, the UN Convention Against Torture definition, which describes torture as for such purposes as, amongst other things, um, getting a confession or information. Um, these things, confession and information, they are historically and contemporaneously the justifications that torturers and states themselves provide for using torture in the first place. So the state will say we had to torture because we had to get information. Now, this isn't a theoretical point. It's a realistic point. If we look at the situation in Israel, for example, the extraction of information is very much the background, both the rationalizing justification and the backstop to the Israeli policy of allowing for uh, torture in particular circumstances. And this was confirmed very recently in 2018 um, by the Supreme Court, sitting as the High Court of Justice, in the case of Tabesh, where they basically invoked a ticking bomb scenario um, as a justification for uh, um, techniques that would amount to torture. So the definition contains the excuse that, that states give. Um, and so this takes us to a, a, a the wider problem here. And it gets into paradox, paradox of 101 of human rights law, which is that torture is state violence, right? It's structural state violence. Um, but states, um, the, the, the human rights definition of torture um, is an individualized account. So in human rights law and in international criminal law, we have an individualized sort of prohibition. Um, so the, the point here is we think about torture as an, an act that happens to an individual or that is perpetrated by an individual. And I want us to think more in terms of torture as a structural state violence. Um, in human rights law, the, it's framed as a prohibition. We talk about the prohibition on torture, but this is often translated um, into the right to be free from torture. And so this takes us to it a second kind of point about the problem with the definition. When we think about the right to be free from torture, we think about the victim. The European Court of Human Rights in particular has placed its gaze on the individual who is tortured. It examines the individual who is tortured for evidence of their torture. Um, we try to understand that somebody shouldn't be tortured by looking for their inherent dignity or their bodily integrity and these kind of abstract notions. Our gaze is taken away from the perpetrator and the state. In international criminal law, the focus is on individual criminal responsibility, of course, and so we're looking at the acts and intentions of the individual. The purposes as outlined in the definition of torture under UNCAT that have been absorbed to some extent by, for example, the European Court of Human Rights, has these kind of purposes where we start to understand torture as having a purpose. So, then we start to think in terms of good torturers and bad torturers and torturers who are doing things for a particular, particular purpose, even if we accept that those purposes are prescribed or prohibited. Um, the individualized point as well. So this is a broad critique of, of human rights law, really, and how it distracts from our understanding of structural violence and torture as state violence. But we also need to, and we hopefully will come back to this, uh, later on, need to think about the definition of torture and the prohibition of torture as, to a great extent, 
um, European definitions, European understandings of torture. So the UN Convention Against Torture, um, for example, the definition in, in it, it will map the sort of history, the European history of torture. When we go to accounts of torture, we start in a European context. Often the account that we start with is the torture in ancient Greece and we move right up through judicial torture in the Middle Ages. So we have a European concept, we have European history and we have a European definition of torture. I would say a, a sort of Western, Europe, uh, Western definition of torture. Um, there isn't an easy way around all of this. The prohibition on torture, the UN definition of torture is not going to say for such purposes as subject, subjugating people so that we can um, um, uh, steal their land or um, civilize them for the purposes of capital accumulation. You know, it's, it's not going to contain those broader structural elements, but it is something that um, concerns me about how we, we start to see the rationalization of torture contained in the definition itself. So yeah, there's, there's uh, several um, uh, bits of that that yeah, would be good to kind of come back to, particularly around these kind of uh, maybe a provincialization of, uh, you know, the his histories and historiographies of, of torture and whatnot. So th this, this next question I, I want to ask is about the ticking time bomb scenario, which you've written about. Um, and it makes me think about the role of the academy in legitimating state practice of torture. And in fact, just before uh, this uh, event, I did a quick n-gram test. Um, for those of you that don't know, is this online search engine that you can use on Google that charts the frequencies of any um, data terms found in sources printed between two specific dates. So I did an n-gram test on the word torture. And the increase uh, in the use of, word, uh, of the word torture occurs around about the 1960s, which is quite telling because that's the kind of Vietnam War, Operation Condor, which is the uh, you know, US state-backed campaign of terror in Latin America where torture was rife. And of course, it continues its upward trajectory through the, the war on terror. And so your paper on the ticking time bomb scenario makes us think about the, the relationship between power, power and knowledge production. Um, and it also made me think about um, the role of the of the public intellectual. And um, Edward Said's writing on this subject, he uses this notion of the uh, metaphorical exile to characterise the role of the intellectual as an outsider, the naysayer, at odds with his society. Um, to quote Stuart Hall, the university is a critical institution or it's nothing. But that's kind of an, um, an ideal normative position especially around questions of torture. And I'm thinking about Gramsci's organic intellectuals who are directly connected to classes or enterprises that use intellectuals to organize interests, gain more power, get more control. So the ticking down to time bomb scenario, which will be familiar to many students and, 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 and anyone who's interested in these issues is an almost ridiculous hypothetical. And yet you've written about it so extensively. Why, and why is it important to understand that hypothetical? Yeah, that's a really lovely lead into that question. And it's exactly how I frame this as well as a, as a um, more or less ridiculous um, hypothetical. Um, and it's ridiculous insofar as, you know, if you, if you present this um, um, hypothetical to somebody who's done quite a lot of thinking about torture well they sort of say well none of this is possible you know let's let's end the conversation there and in my view that's where the conversation should end you don't you ought not get into the mechanics of the taking bomb scenario as such but it's very much connected to my first the first question and my first point on the way in which the definition sort of contains the rationalizations that states um, also use. So the taking bomb scenario, I would say, creates an imaginary world of torture. The hypothetical itself uh, creates this imaginary world that torture is for a purpose, it's extraction of information. Um, and this, again, purpose we see actually in the definition. Um, the way in which academics then also discuss this hypothetical is also part of the creation of this imaginary world. And the main way to think about that is that we get this sort of debate 
um, on how you should respond. This in the, in the aftermath of 9-11, this debate really sprung up in the United States. And you could say that it's kind of waning quite a bit at this point, although I would say that we're seeing sort of the um, remnants of that debate, for example, in the Overseas Operations Bill that's on its way through Parliament as, as it stands. Um, but that debate in the sort of post 9-11 context had an almost ridiculous element. You know, when you think about some of the, I won't even name some of them, some of the people who propagated their views on how you would manage the taking bomb scenario best within the rule of law, or the idea of the good torture who would step outside the bounds of the rule of law to, uh, to torture and then would subject himself to public accountability and so on. A, a creation of an entirely imaginary world, um, which was all part of a construction of the identity of the American state as um, non-torturing generally and only torturing in these very trying circumstances. And that's precisely how the taking bomb scenario works. It presents torture as aberrational as opposed to structural. Um, and again, just to say that Israel has been using a version of this taking bomb scenario to underpin its policy since the 80s without really international scrutiny uh, to a great, okay, there is international scrutiny, but without international outcry of the sort of breach of this uh, transnational crime. So the taking bomb scenario, it's a busy concept. It does a lot of work. It provides the imagery, it provides the rationale and the justification for the use of torture. It frames the individual um, as sacrificing themselves um, or acting courageously, and it totally abstracts torture from that kind of structural um, state violence context that torture isn't, is quite a mundane practice. It's a, it's a practice that's quite constant and that uh, requires structures and requires authorization and requires consent of the state. Um, so we start to think of uh, torture in a sort of good apples versus bad apples context. And this, again, plays into the way in which states explain away torture. So we distract from the institutional or organizational situational context of torture. Um, we suggest that there are the good guys um, who are doing it only because they need to. And this again is built into the definition because the definition contains those individualized purposes. The interrogator is using torture for this purpose. Um, it takes us back to the very fundamental problem with purposes. And actually the, on that point, there's a really excellent new article in the State Crime Journal um, by Ergun Kakal on the problem with purposes. Um, and how it's framed in the UN definition. It's in the 2001, uh, two, 2000, the 2021 uh, second edition, open access. So people are starting to really think about this, the, the, the problem with purpose. Um, but we see how this starts, how this works. The bad apples are those who deviate from the ban. They're deviant. Uh, torture is normally a, a prohibition that's respected. We saw, see this kind of context in Abu Ghraib where those tortures were described as a few bad apples. That's the way in which the US um, uh, described and contextualized those guys who did things beyond the norm, things that weren't expected. Yet in 2014, Barack Obama was able to stand um, at a press conference and say, we tortured some folks. And in the context of that speech, you'll see a language of, a, we had to do it. Our country was scared. We tortured some folks. Torture is bad. It's against our values. Uh, but you have to understand that these people um, were doing this because you were scared. So that's the kind of context in which the bad apples approach. The ban is also the way in which the good apples uh, can be freed from that kind of um, um, exam uh, that, that context of understanding this as structural. Um, this creation of a kind of imagination around torture, you know, this has been Darius Rajali in his, in most of his writing on torture refers to this, but particularly when he's looking at the French Algerian war, he identifies the taking bomb scenarios having kind of emerged out of the French Algerian war. And this is the site of modern 
to torture apology. So the ticking bomb scenario is the embodiment of, this, of, the, embody, of the apology that state modern democracies will give for using torture, right? And so where does he see this creation of an imagination around torture? He identifies it as coming from these fictional contexts. The um, novel by uh, Jean Lartargy, um, Les, Les Centurions, which was uh, adapted to film. I don't know if you've seen it, Tanzo, but Lost Command, um, directed by a Canadian guy, which wasn't a great hit in, in, in the US uh, cinemas, but which was a big hit in French cinemas, is the very embodiment of this kind of taking bomb rationale, where you have these individual paratroopers who've been in Vietnam, they're weary, um, they're heroic, they go to Algeria, and they're, they're in, um, they encounter this kind of guerrilla warfare and terror, and they have to use torture in response because there are bombs ticking and they need to stop them. So the ticking bomb scenario emerges out of fiction, a fictional kind of rationalization of what those uh, paratroopers were doing in Algeria. What in effect we know now, following the work of uh, Raphael Branche and Rita Maran and all of those uh, wonderful scholars of the French Algerian War is that torture was an institutional widespread systematic practice in, French, in Algeria, uh, that it was used to subjugate the population, to dominate the population. Um, and that uh, the, when we, the, the use of torture was so extensive that it broke the FLN essentially. So it was effective in breaking the FLN because if you torture enough people, and some early execute them, well, you're going to have some success. But it was translated into a myth of having had to do it to stop the bombs. And that sort of amnesia around torture um, um, after the war, that sense that we had to do it, you know, it was part of rebuilding the French um, reputation and morale after that war. And of course, we then start to see the ticking bomb proliferate. So the French went to the United States, Paul Azaris, amongst others, to train. Uh, they went to Argentina. Argentina, Melanie Collard has an amazing book about the way in which the uh, French uh, became involved in training Argentinians in the use of torture. Um, this all reappeared post 9-11 when um, Paul Azaris was on Democracy Now, talking about the use of torture to stop taking bombs. And of course, we know that there was a screening of the Battle of Algiers and the Pentagon and so on. So French Algeria um, use of torture really kind of has a strong position in, in, in the history of this ticking bomb. And because public intellectuals have then accepted it, this is, I would say, we understand torture today, not as the subjugation and domination of a colonized people, um, the use of torture in order to pacify or to transform them. Um, this is not how we understand torture. We understand it as something that happens in an interrogation room, sometimes by a sadist, sometimes by a courageous interrogator to stop bombs. And we have to pull up, we have to unpack all of that kind of um, ideology that's been created around the ticking bomb in order to start to understand well, what is it then? It's domination and it's subjugation. What does that mean? Long answer. Sorry. No, br brilliantly uh, detailed and insightful. And I think there's so much from that, you know, especially around, um, you know, the, the creation of a common sense around, uh, you know, torture. And that cultural production doesn't just come from, you know, what Gramsci calls the organic intellectuals, but also from, from pop culture. I think it's, it's really interesting about, you know, how, how films, music um, can, 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 can be part of that cultural socialization that legitimates, uh, you know, the use of, uh, of uh, torture for, for a state violence. Um, but one of the things that you, you talked about was uh, that torture was uh, important for the French in uh, rebuilding uh, the French and, and French morale during the, um, the, the colonial war. But um, as, as you write as well in your paper, quoting Klein, Torture is also about the unmaking body and minds of the of the tortured so that they can be made and remade. Um, and you, you also said, quote, it is necessary to understand that states torture bodies 
that they ideologically construct, stigmatize as less than human. So what, what do you mean by stigmatization in this context? And how do you link this to, to class, gender and race? You, you've touched on them, but maybe if you could uh, uh, dive into them a little bit more. Uh, great, thanks. Yeah, and that Hollywoodization, by the way, in your um, the pop culture, I mean, this is so crucial to understanding how we've all developed a, a sort of sense that we understand what torture is because we see it in, in police um, serial dramas, we see it in movies and, and so on. Um, um, the question on the stigmatization, so yeah, Naomi Klein, um, her her question to uh, when she was trying to understand in in um, in relation to Iraq why torture was happening and her understanding that this was about on making bodies so they can rebuild them this has been incredibly formative to to my thinking about how torture is really part of um, pacifying or civilizing a population but also um, pacifying and civilizing the history, the, 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 the torturing state's history. And so one of the things that I've, having written about the taking bomb fairly extensively and having, having looked at Algeria really extensively and having also thought about uh, what Klein had to say in Iraq, uh, about the use of torture in Iraq, um, I wanted to try to think about, well, how do states really understand themselves as non, non torturing states? So we have a really robust, formidable, almost in, um, prohibition on torture. In a, in a chapter in uh, the handbook that my Taking Bomb um, chapter is written in, Rob Pryor describes it as a um, transnational prohibition. So it's maybe perhaps not an international crime yet, but it's a transnational crime. States perhaps haven't reached the understanding that this is um, a crime of, of, or aren't fully agreed that, that it's of sufficient sort of brutality to be understood in international, as an international crime, but certainly states are agreed that it's pretty bad. We have extensive rhetorical commitment to the ban, states condemn torture. Um, and yet torture is practiced, you know, extensively. And so how do we start to, uh, to understand these things. Um, and what is, the, um, what is it that uh, states are condemning when, it is this, when we know that it's states which condemn that are practicing torture themselves? So how does this kind of hypocrisy work? And so you'll have to, I'll have to give you a little bit of background on, on the use of stigma in this context in order to sort of show why stigmatization can help us to unlock some of, of the questions around torture. I'm in the process of finding a new home for, or finding a home uh, for a paper on the special stigma of torture in the European Court of Human Rights context. So famously in the 1978 decision um, in the European Court of Human Rights in Ireland versus United Kingdom, the European Court distinguished torture from inhuman and degrading treatment uh, on the basis of severity, five techniques used against the so-called hooded men in interrogation in 1971 in internment in Northern Ireland was described by the European Court as inhuman and degrading, um, but not torture. And this was a departure from the European Commission's decision. It was very controversial and so on. But it reached for this concept, the special stigma of torture. It said torture has a special stigma. And I've been mulling over this concept for years. So why um, did they choose the special stigma? And what do they mean that it has a special stigma? Uh, why would we talk about torture as special? Uh, what's this about? And I really started to think about this when I was looking at a photo of um, the, a number of the surviving hooded men. So those men who have been uh, tortured in the context of opera Operation Dem Demetrius in Northern Ireland. They were stood in front of the, I think it was the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs. They were pictured in the Irish Times. And I was looking at the picture and I was trying to think, well, why, why, did, why is the special, special stigma not attached to what happened to them? And you're looking at these men and there's nothing obvious to say that they were tortured when you look at their bodies and their faces and smiling in the photograph or not smiling and so on. But still the question was raised to me, well, were they not stigmatized? Was there not 
some kind of stigma attached to their torture. And so this brought me to an examination of the special stigma. Um, I've been thinking about this for a number of years and, you know, I've been quite lucky because um, um, Imogen Tyler was good enough to, to write an entire book on stigma that just came out quite recently, which is a really excellent piece of work. Um, and she's, that work has really helped me to work out why stigma is useful for kind of thinking about torture. And so stigma has numerous meanings, right? It's um, in its most literal sense, we're talking about marking, branding. Um, it refers to marks made upon the skin. Its history includes ancient practices of marking um, or branding slaves and outlaws in particular. When we talk about the stigmata, um, and this will reveal my Irish Catholic upbringing, um, you think of the marks resembling um, uh, the wounds on the crucified body of Christ. We think of stigmatics, uh, those uh, devout persons who claim to have been stigmatized in, um, in the manner of uh, Jesus Christ. Um, this is, of course, distrusted today as kind of pathology or hocus pocus, um, but it really brings to mind a kind of powerful image of Christ's suffering and sacrifice and redemption. But actually, the meanings of stigma, those kind of meanings have been overtaken by the more figurative sense of stigma. So stigma, today we think of um, attributes that are deemed abnormal, uh, a reason for an, an, in, an individual or a group. They have an undesired differentness. Um, and I'm quoting um, uh, Imogen Tyler there. Uh, they're shunned for this. So in the Ireland versus UK case, what I'm arguing is that they invoked this idea of a special stigma in a figurative sense, um, that torture is a very deviant act, um, and therefore it, it, it deserves to be considered to have a kind of special stigma, states that torture should be stigmatized for doing so because it's such a bad thing to do. Now, they brought this um, word into usage in the context of a case where the United Kingdom was deemed not to have tortured. So the special stigma didn't attach to the UK. They weren't going to be stigmatized or shunned for their use of torture in this context. Um, but in the use of the special stigma, and this is where I try to get at the unconscious kind of development of the European idea of torture. The European Court of Human Rights is kind of, it's redirecting or rerouting its definition of torture. First of all, it's saying the torture is the most severe kind of pain and suffering beyond the techniques that had, the men have been subjected to. And second, it has this special stigma and the UK is not to be stigmatized. And so in the context of a state that was torturing, they were freed from this special stigma. And the European court in doing so kind of said that bad stuff, the really bad torture, that happens elsewhere. We don't do this in Europe. So the special stigma was invoked, I argue, to kind of um, condemn and oppose torture, happens elsewhere, um, whilst conjuring up an idea of Europe as non-torturing, as kind of civilized, as, as, as not um, steeping, stepping down to or, or um, um, lowering itself to the use of such techniques. And whilst it did all of this, it disappeared the European history of torture, that, his, that torture is, is a European uh, practice, that torture was, the, the UK had not aberrationally tortured in Northern Ireland, it had been torturing for decades in the colonies, it had admitted this in the context, using the five techniques, had, had, used, had admitted this in the context of the case, um, and so on. So it produced a special stigma in a case in which it found no stigma. Okay, so in so doing, it saves the UK from stigmatization and it saves Europe from stigmatization. The UK or Britain being one of the founding members of uh, the European Convention and Court System. So stigma kind of operates to define, uh, redefine torture in the interests of the state in this sense. And the European court kind of modernized a European history of stigma of stigmatization through torture in the use of this term. So it kind of reached for the special stigma to underline the exceptional abhorrence of torture, but it did so in this case by 
reinterpreting torture as quantitative, something that you can measure and weigh up, a legible experience of pain and suffering because it looked for evidence on the bodies of the men, um, evidence of their pain and suffering. It looked for the stigma, essentially, and it couldn't find them. So it sought the stigma, the marks of torture to evidence the victim's torture status, but, it, but um, in so doing, what the European Court of Human Rights did was to um, ignore the power of the state to subjugate, to uh, stigmatize through torture. And the court followed the logic of the state. It followed the sort of tawdry logic of the state, which contemporaneously tortures in a clean way, tortures without leaving marks. Um, but it also sort of referred back, what the European Court did there in a really odd turn of events is referred back to a long history of stigmatizing through torture. So um, in, in the indictment of um, criminals, slaves, witches through the ages, they have been stigmatized, marked, or they have been searched in a stigmatizing way uh, for evidence of their guilt. So um, the special stigma in a way uh, sort of led me to think uh, more broadly about this concept of stigmatization and how do we relate this to torture? So in the definition of torture under the UN Convention Against Torture, we do have reference to discrimination as a, as a um, purpose for which states or torturers may use torture for the purpose of discrimination of any kind. And this is something actually that's really underdeveloped um, in, in the context of understanding torture. But stigmatization, I think, can lead us to really understand the way in which um, groups or individuals are marked out um, uh, by society that torture in a Stanley, uh, Stanley Cohen per kind of context is if you want to understand who might be tortured, you look for groups that are traditionally marked out or, or discriminated against within the state. So stigma can play a double role really in helping us to understand um, why states torture, how states torture. Um, and in this um, uh, particularly con particular context, the European Court has kind of unconsciously revealed um, the stigmatizing kind of function of torture. Um, so that's a pretty long-winded way of, of uh, answering, answering that question. So kind of re related to that, this, this is my uh, penultimate question um, around stigmatization. And in keeping with this incredibly deep and original reading of the convention articles, is this um, political theological approach um, that, that you, you, you developed or are developing. What, what does a political theological approach bring to our understanding of torture? Uh, great. So it's a, it's a, it's a kind of um, natural lead on from this question of stigma to kind of think about political theology as, as, a, as an alternative to understanding the practice of torture. So it brings me kind of full circle back to the problem with purpose as an understanding. Um, we underst if we attempt to, to understand torture through the lens of purpose, um, we um, start to look at the intentions and the motivated motives of, of perpetrators, the individual intentions and so on. We get into, into that problematic discussion of the good apples and the bad apples and so forth. Whereas, and, and we also make an act, which um, as an act of state violence, uh, which is deeply complicated, we make it sort of easy to understand and very rational in a sense. Well, it's for information, it's pain for information. Um, and unpacking, um, unpacking all of the, the sort of way in which we've reached that very simplistic understanding of torture, which allows the state, the violent state off the hook to, and the, the criminal state off the hook on uh, torture by sort of making it about individuals in interrogation rooms. Um, once we've unpacked all of that and reached the sense of, well, okay, if you're saying it's not as simple as that, well then, well then what is it? And my point is that torture is a very 
complex practice. It doesn't, um, it doesn't, it's, it doesn't have a simple means and ends relationship. So there is no simple ends to which torture is the means. And so we have to, we have to um, embrace the complexity of it to an extent and, and, and think about, well, why, what is the sort of this, this practice that has been around uh, since at least ancient Greece? Um, what sustains it? What are, what, are, what are the ways in which we can understand it differently? And this leads me to a kind of political theological um, thinking about torture. So I, on, on two counts, um, torture has to be thought about differently. First of all, is a structural or state, uh, state violence. And secondly, um, I'm arguing as an alternative approach or as a, a way to, to motivate us to think a little bit differently about this, to think about the, the, the link be between theology and torture. So the civilizing mission, which I've kind of alluded to um, in relation to French Algeria is very well known um, probably to many people in, in the room and as a um, motivation or as a way in which um, the colonies were kind of redescribed. Um, the French, for example, were bringing civilization to the colonies. We are um, bringing progress and so on. And torture is kind of, in Rita Maran's words, the dark side of this, that, that um, we're going to torture you into civilization, essentially. I want to think a little bit about where does um, the Christian I, Christ, Christianization play into this. And in a sense, the lead into this is through the really provocative work of Paul Kahn, who writes on sacred violence. Um, and he's conceptualized torture as an act of sovereign violence, a form of sacrifice that inscribes on the body a sacred presence. So he draws a theological parallel uh, between torture and repentance. Um, the objective of torture is confession, was confession, which has a dual purpose of providing information and also acknowledging sin, sin against the sovereign or against God. Um, so this theological parallel in, in, in the sense of God and the sovereign, which um, the subject's criminal actions serve to deny the presence of authority or authority of the sovereign and judicial torture in the Middle Ages kind of reaffirms the sovereign. And so Khan, for Khan, um, he sees a kind of political theology in, in, a, um, in a kind of uh, parallel, a theological parallel. And, and I find this parallel kind of groundbreaking to an extent. Um, the way in which we understand torture as a kind of um, acknowledgement of sin, confession as, as uh, being brought back into the fold as such. But we have to be really careful with the theological parallel uh, because what we don't want to do is to substitute sort of theology for power in analyzing torture. So sacrifice and political theology, they don't describe torture, uh, but they do get at the kind of ideology that propels it, I would argue. So the language I think that we use to describe torture is really important to avoid mystifying or kind of reifying violence. Um, the confession, which is forced through judicial torture, um, it served the purpose of justifying both the indictment and the punishment. So the coercion of confession was a procedural part of judicial torture. And the information or confession also justified the torture's action, gratification um, of their violence. But the context in which torture is practiced is also important. There isn't an inevitable kind of, and when we talk about political theology, we think about Carl Schmitt, there isn't an in inevitable impasse between war and gods or between friend and enemy. Torture is an exercise of power. It's an exercise of power on a body that is subjugated and it appears when a state is on a mission to civilize. So um, rather than thinking with kind of Carl Schmitt in political theological terms, I want to think a little bit more of, of um, political theology as, as, a, an, as ideology. It's a tool to think with, to follow kind of Adam Cox go and his use of political theology. It helps us to, to unravel the kind of way in which uh, an ideology of torture grows in a state or a society. Um, 
And in the special stigma, I think, the court kind of roused the political theology of torture uh, by evoking, you know, the stigmata, by evoking the absence of evidence of those, those wounds on uh, the bodies of the men. Um, but to bring that into a sort of more general perspective, there's been a relative dearth of attention to the kind of, you know, the, the way in which uh, torture has been such a significant part of Christian history. Um, the torture uh, that sort of is at the, at the um, origins of, of Christian history to an extent is the crucifixion. Um, and so you may have, some of you may have noticed that on the advertisement for this event was a, a it was a picture lifted from the Battle of Algiers. And in that um, particular picture, the torture victim is kind of, has a sort of echo or iconogra iconographical image of uh, Christ's uh, crucifixion. And actually, if you start to, to really look at the use of torture in the modern age, you start to see those iconogra iconographical echoes uh, throughout our history. Abu Ghraib, for example, where uh, one of those photographs was a, was a stage of the crucifixion. And so you start to see that there is a deep link, that one of the most potent images recognizable to all universally is the cross, which is an image, a Christian image of suffering. It's a, a, an image of the um, redem redemption through suffering as such. So political theology, I think, can start us to get a little bit at some of the uh, way, a different way of thinking about pain. Pain is negative, right? But also throughout history, pain has also been considered a kind of positive um, a way of redeeming, a um, um, of, of salvation. And so I would just like us to think a little bit about um, in the colonial context, for example, when we're talking about a mission to civilize, when we hear the torture is sort of part of that mission, how do we square this? Civilized countries abhor torture and yet they sit, they use torture in these contexts. Well, they have stigmatized groups, they have placed them outside as subhuman, dehumanized, non-human other, and torture is part of a process of elimination or in fact of, um, of redemption, of bringing back into the, the Christian fold. So a kind of uh, re political reading of um, a, Christian, a Christianizing mission. That's the sort of angle that um, I'm trying to work with to understand European torture, European colonial torture in particular, but European torture uh, contemporaneously. Another pretty long answer. Thanks for that, Michelle. Um, you, you know, really excited to see uh, where, where that goes, you know, using that political theological approach. And um, I think hopefully people will forgive us for going over uh, time a little bit. Um, I do have one last question, but I think you've kind of um, uh, referenced it in, in the answers to the other questions, but you, you, might wear, you may want to add uh, something to this. But why is it important to think about torture as a state crime? So I actually think it's, it's the, um, the most important question of all, really. Um, Obviously, state crime is is difficult to um, to pinpoint um, a definition of sort of torture as a state crime. Um, but what I what I think um, when we look at there there are a couple of factors here. First of all, it's the the risk that is inherent in moving to an individualized thinking about torture of individuals who are tortured. Uh, trying to understand and asking them, well, why were you tortured? What, what is it about you that makes you torturable? That kind of approach, which, which I think the European Court has actually adopted to an extent problematically. So, um, and also in a kind of um, context where, where I would favor not uh, just to steal a little bit from 
uh, Matthew Pinto, who had this wonderful piece in Critical Legal Thinking yesterday, um, not thinking about torture in overly kind of carceral terms or penal terms, um, if we want to look at sort of prosecution of individual tortures and so on, to think of the prosecution of individuals is to distract us from the kind of the apparatus this, and the ideology in particular that underpins torture. So in that sense, it's important to think about uh, torture as a state crime, but it's not, it's not just that. We're not going to work out torture looking through the lens of the individual right to be free from torture or um, a prohibition on torture approach. And there's, you know, two really easy ways of thinking about this. First of all, torture is a concept, uh, sorry, to torture is an act or a practice that travels, you know, travels transnationally. As I said, the um, um, Algerian practices were used tortures went to the US and went to, uh, went to Argentina, Argentina and elsewhere to train. But torture also travels through time. So if we were to think about, for example, individual perpetrators in the context of Iraq and miss the fact that the five techniques, which had been apart, banned in a kind of political sense in 1972 in the House of Commons, are reappearing in Iraq uh, decades later, if we look to individual perpetrators, but don't look to this kind of state context, the fact that torture has traveled through time, uh, the institution of the five techniques has existed across um, the colonies. Edward Heath in 1972 in the House of Commons said, well, these five techniques have been in use elsewhere across the colonies in Aden and Palestine, um, in Kenya. And so uh, torture as a, an individual crime or an individual a right to be free from torture doesn't help us to understand that transnational and that transhistorical kind of existence of torture that keeps on reappearing. But I also think that if we understand torture very much through an individual lens, we miss, and one of the real motivations for trying to understand torture from more of a political theological perspective is to the state has had the monopoly on defining torture. You know, in uh, in an article in the New York Times in the 80s, J.M. Quetzi talking about the novelist, the, the role of the novelist, he um, made a plea for the novelist not to, um, to follow the tawdry kind of logic of the state in their representations of torture in their novels or in, you know, let's not represent the torture represent torture as the state wants us to. And yet in law, we most certainly represent torture as the state wants us to. Now, you know, that's again 101 because international law is constructed by states and written by states. Um, but the main point is that the definition of torture is a very, uh, it's, a, it's a tightly wielded definition. We're talking about the most severe forms of pain. We're talking about purposes, which we understand in an individualized context, as opposed to purposes in a structural context. And it neglects, you know, it doesn't, we, when we talk about torture today, we have in mind a male interrogator in, in a police um, interrogation center to a great extent. But uh, torture is, so we have a gendered reading of what torture is, it excludes. We have um, yesterday, just yesterday as it was, um, Minker or Traveller Ethnicity Recognition Day, I listened to Rosemary Mon, who's a traveller rights activist, um, her podcast with Reboot Republic. I listened to that. It's an amazing, uh, it's an amazing episode. But she used the term slow torture time and time again to describe the situation of the traveller community in Ireland. And you know, this is really, it brings to mind Rob Nixon's kind of slow violence. Um, the, um, it expands the idea of torture beyond this kind of tight remit of the interrogation room, which is the state's choice of the definition of torture. It expands it to, to make us realize that torture is, is a concept that, that has a broader remit that, you know, we can think about the gendered aspect of torture as well in the context of reproductive violence and so on. So, um, I think that the until we sort of start to, to, to come back, remove ourselves from this very 
um, particular and narrow notion of torture, we're not really going to understand the extent that torture structures our contemporary society um, and is a kind of racialized and gendered um, um, act or practice. Thank you uh, so much for that uh, comprehensive, uh, all of those comprehensive answers, Michelle, given us uh, much to, to think about.